All right. Yeah, good morning. Good to see you today. On this, um, yeah, I'm, on this day I mentioned already, but uh, switching to daylight savings time, and we always seem to catch a few with with that. You know, we um, as we're on this series with a prayer. And I've uh, been going at it now for a while, and we'll have so today, and then uh, one more week, next week, uh, dealing with uh, this uh, tremendous subject. And uh, I came across this. I thought it was kind of interesting on uh, one, one person's uh, kind of take on prayer, where he said, uh, a journalist was assigned to the Jerusalem borough of its newspaper. He gets an apartment overlooking the Wailing Wall. After several weeks, he realizes that whenever he looks at the wall, he sees an old Jewish man praying vigorously. The journalist wondered whether there's a pub publishable story here. So he goes down to the wall, he introduces himself, and he says, you come every day to the wall, what are you praying for? The old man replies, he says, what am I praying for? In the morning, I pray for world peace. Then I pray for the brotherhood of man. I go home, have a glass of tea, and I come back to the wall to pray for the eradication of illness and disease from the earth. Well, the journalist is taken aback by the man's old man's sincerity and persistence. You mean you've been coming to the wall to pray every day for these things? The old man nods. Well, how long have you been coming to the wall to pray for these things? The old man becomes reflective and then replies, how long? Maybe 20, 25 years. The amazed journalist finally asks, well, how does it feel to come and pray every day for over 20 years for these things? How does it feel, the old man replies? Feels like I'm talking to a wall. <laughs> Maybe you've uh, wondered that too, perhaps sometimes in your prayers. Uh, I hope not, but. So we're going to look a little more at this uh, subject I entitled uh, today, uh, Be Like a Bulldog in Your Prayers. And it comes especially from uh, Luke 18, uh, the first eight verses, a, a parable that Jesus tells there. I'd like to begin by reading uh, that parable. Luke 18, beginning at verse 1, he says, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your great encouragement in your word for us to pray. And I pray as we look at this subject brought up by this parable that you would instruct us and teach us and by your spirit help us to apply it in the ways that, that we need it. And so we give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this morning I'd like to, uh, you know, address maybe it's one of the more mysterious, mysterious, I think, aspects of prayer as we're dealing with this tremendous subject. And it, actually in our, you know, very fast paced, we live in this instant society in which we live in, it's probably one of the more unpopular concepts dealing with prayer. And it's this idea that uh, calls for this like I put it, this bulldog-like tenacity in our prayers. Not to be bullheaded, but this call for persistence. I mean, sometimes the idea that the Lord, who is so loving and yet, uh, you know, so eager to bless, that he needs to be asked for something time after time, sometimes, sometimes year after year for something, it's often quite surprising to us. Why would that be the case. It's hard to understand. I mean, is it, is it really necessary for us to keep bringing the same request to him time after time? Or does that kind of thing just reveal a lack of faith on our part? 
some wonder. So well, whatever our initial thoughts are on this subject, persistence in prayer is a very biblical idea. And in fact, we see it taught here. And uh, it's a very uh, uh, essential element of prayer. Jesus himself uh, taught it. He demonstrated it. He even commanded it. So let's do, uh, um, how, look at this great theme of how important it is that we pray, we keep praying, you don't lose heart, you don't quit. All right. So point one, if you're following along on your notes, there's this. Jesus taught the necessity of bulldog-like persistence in prayer. You know, right away in this story, Jesus gives the whole purpose of it. So it's, it's right up front, it's very clear. Verse one, he's telling them this story, the purpose of it being that they ought always to pray and not to lose heart. Don't give up, keep praying. There's this purpose of the story. So if you wonder, what's the story about? He gives it to you in plain English, right? Well, it's an art thing, it's English anyway. But he wants them to know that persistence in prayer is just not, oh, you know, I'll take it or leave it kind of thing. It's a very necessary element of our prayer lives, persistence. Uh, we're to keep praying even though we don't, we may feel like quitting or if we may feel like saying, you know, it's not working, we're to keep going, to keep praying. There's uh, two characters in this story. Uh, the first is the uh, unrighteous judge, this unjust uh, judge. It says, basically, it says he doesn't give a hoot for anybody, uh, not for man or God, doesn't fear God, doesn't respect man. Know anybody like that? Uh, you know, if you wanted to ask somebody for something, this is the guy you would not want to ask. Uh, you wouldn't want to go to him. Uh, the other character in the story is this needy widow. And uh, she doesn't have much chance of getting what she's asking for. Uh, but she had one weapon, though, if you want to call it that. It was her persistence. And uh, note in verse 3, it says this, there's a widow who, who kept coming. She just kept coming to him and saying, give me justice. And notice, it seems to me that that which she is asking for is, is a good thing. I mean, she's not asking for Give me a million dollars. Give me, I want to get revenge. No, she's asking for a good thing. I need, you know, justice against my adversary. So it doesn't seem to be a request that's all aligned. And that's what the judge should be doing, it seems to me. It's answering those kinds of things. Well, uh, you know, she keeps saying, give me justice. He keeps saying, no, give me justice. No, he keeps refusing her. Uh, but now in verse five, you see an interesting thing. It says, because this widow keeps bothering me. I'll give her justice, just so that she won't, you know, beat me down by her continual coming. Psyche is saying, okay, yes, I am, I'm a ruthless judge. I don't fear God or man. You know, I'm going to give her what she asked for because this lady, is she's driving me nuts. She's driving me crazy. She won't leave me alone. I'll, you know, I'll give her what she asked for so she will be done. But so the point to the parable is, is that is on account of her persistence that her request was answered. Again, that's, and how? In response to prayer. Uh, you know, and the Lord applies this then to prayer in verse 7. He says, and will not God give justice to his elect, to his people, who cry to him day and night? And the answer, the answer well, of course he will. And actually, the, uh, if you might notice, in the beginning of the word, uh, verse 7, it has the word and. Uh, the word that's there could be translated either way, and or but, and the idea is, but will not God uh, what Jesus is doing is he's setting up a contrast between the unrighteous judge and God. All that the judge is, God is not. I mean, the judge was unrighteous. God is not. Uh, the judge was ruthless. God is not. The judge did not care about people. God does. And so he's, he's bringing out some of these uh, contrasts. But there is one similarity. And that's this, both of them sometimes delay their response. Okay, let's take a look at that. It says, you know, God promises justice to his people. How will it come in response to prayer? I mean, again, that's part of this whole parable. The judge delayed out of indifference. He didn't care. God never does that. God doesn't delay out of indifference because we know he, he loves people. Now notice in verse 8, he loves us, he says, you know, to his elect, to his people. Verse 8, he says, I tell you, he'll give justice to them speedily. 
You know, when you read that, and that's a thing that comes into my mind, how do you reconcile that idea that he'll answer them speedily within this idea that you have to pray persistently? I mean, if it's going to answer speedily, I wouldn't have to keep praying for it. Well, there's really no contradiction there. The same word that's used here, as translated speedily, is also found in Revelation, let's see, I think I have the verse, yeah, verse, chapter 22, verse 7, where Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. It's the same word, quickly, it's translated quickly there, speedily, same word. And you go, uh, when did he say that? He said that about 2,000 years ago. That doesn't seem quickly to me. I mean, it's like, you know, your wife calls you, dinner's ready, come eat dinner, okay, I'll be there quickly. Doesn't mean I'm, you know, coming in 2,000 years. Uh, you know, so, but the idea is that it, what, what he's getting at is not that, it's not so much addressing, uh, you know, when he's coming, but almost addressing how he's coming. The idea is that when he does come, he will come quickly. When the time is right for the prayer to be answered, it will come speedily. The answer will come quickly. So it's not so much when it will be answered, but how it will be. That when it's the time is right, it will happen quickly. And I think it's a point that he's, he's making there. And so we need to keep on praying. It'll, it'll come speedily, right on time. So again, but the main point as he gives us of this parable is that we're to pray, keep on praying, be persistent in our prayers, don't lose heart, don't quit. And that's sometimes that's tough for us to do, especially when, you know, nowadays we like everything fast. And yet we see it, Jesus taught this idea. All right. A uh, second point I have there on the sheet is Jesus demonstrated. Not only did he teach it, he demonstrated persistence in prayer. And this is from that passage I read earlier in Mark 14, where he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And remember it says he prays, you know, three goals and, you know, there, uh, uh, you know, prays three times. And especially the phrase, of verse in there, it says, and again he went and he, and he said, he prayed the same words, you know, using the same words again. So he was being persistent. He prayed once, they were sleeping, he goes back, prays the same thing again, they were still sleeping, goes back, prays the same thing again. He, he's demonstrating persistence in prayer, I think, in that. You know, Jesus, who was led by the Spirit, he prayed, what, the disciples led by... The flesh, they slept. You know, Jesus listened to the spirit he prayed. They listened to the reasonings of the flesh and of their body and went to sleep. You know, the, the point here, though, that I want to make is that Jesus demonstrated persistence in prayer. What did the disciples demonstrate? Persistence in sleeping. But anyway, the point is, uh, the, my point is that uh, Jesus demonstrated persistence. So he taught it. He demonstrated it. You know, persistence in life, as we all know, is it's a very important thing. You've got to have persistence. If you want to get anywhere in life, you need persistence. Uh, you've got to stick to it. Um, you know, like the, the saying goes, uh, the snail reached the ark by persistence. Probably took the snail maybe a long time to get there, but he hung in there. Uh, persistence. Kids sometimes can be very persistent. Um, whenever I think of persistence in prayer, I always think of... Um, uh, incident, I think I've shared it before, uh, of our daughter, Laura, when she was about three, uh, we were up at, the, uh, up at my wife's folks' trailer up at Lake of the Woods, right near uh, Wheeler's Point, and they had this trailer house, and we were up there, and, and uh, it, was, it was afternoon, and you know, up there at the lake, and you know, it was a good place to take a nap, and so we, I went into this middle room where we were sleeping, but we also had our daughter, Laura, she was in a playpen in there. And so it was time for her to take a nap. So I thought, okay, I'll take a nap, you know, I'll lay right here and, and, uh, and take a nap too. And so we, you know, I put her in the playpen and I lay down in the bed and I, she was squirming around and pretty soon I could see out the corner of my eye, you know, she gets one leg up over the side of the playpen. I thought, oh man. And then sure enough, both legs and she's out. I thought, oh, she's not going to be sleeping. And that, some reason I pretended just to be sleeping. So she comes over and she starts to push me a little bit, you know, trying to wake me up. And I, I didn't respond. And uh, then she starts shaking me a little more, you know, you know wake up. I, I still didn't respond. I was kind of hoping maybe, 
I knew she went, you know, somehow she'd crawl back in the playpen, which she wasn't going to do, and take a nap. I wanted to take a nap. And uh, so she quit shaking me. And then I, you know, kind of watch, you know, seeing what she's doing. And then she crawls up on me and she sits on my face. <laughs> and I, what? And, and, and uh, somehow I still, you know, didn't do anything. And then she starts bouncing on my face. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I can't believe it. And, uh, and I, I don't know why. I, I mean, I think back, I don't know why I didn't do anything. I was still pretending I was sleeping. Why? I don't know why. It's crazy. But, and so then she quits. I still, you know, uh, I was trying to be persistent too. Uh, anyway, uh, and she gets off. And I thought, oh, okay, what's she going to do now? You know, and then uh, she, somehow she finds, I don't know where she found it, somewhere on the floor, an old balloon that had been popped. So this old dirty balloon on the floor. So she picks it up and she comes over and she lays it right on my face. And I thought, what? And, 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 and I thought, you know, I'm getting to a point where I was about, you know, I had enough. And uh, then a, a moment later, she takes two of her fingers and she jams them in my mouth and she pulls open my mouth and with the other hand, she shoves that balloon in my mouth. And that, that was enough. It's like she wanted me to blow it up, you know, and I forget it. I got up, that's enough. There's no naps that day for anyone. And she out persisted me. And, um, but yeah, kids can be very persistent. We know that. We've all had experiences with that. So, but persistence. Jesus taught it. He demonstrated it. And one more I got on here. Jesus commanded persistence in prayer. Uh, in Luke uh, 11, let's see, just a couple verses. Uh, it says this. Get to that. He, uh, he says this, and I tell you, uh, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. And he's talking about prayer. He goes on and talks about prayer here. But the idea is um, uh, he gives, these are three commands here. To ask, to seek, to knock. And in the, uh, the form in which they were written, you, they could very more accurately be translated. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. It's not just a, you know, once and you're done. And so we see three, as he's speaking in the context of prayer, he gives these three commands to keep praying, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. So, uh, you know, just as much as Jesus commands us to love one another, he commands us to, you know, keep praying. Don't quit. You know, you know we may feel like it, but now, I think a legitimate question to ask at this point is, to how does this idea of persistence in prayer differ from uh, vain repetition? You know, Jesus spoke against people who just, you know, vain repetitions in their prayer. You know, they just keep saying the same thing over and over again. How does this differ from that? You know, he got after the legalistic Pharisees because they, they thought by uh, just saying the same thing over and over again, it's almost like a magic charm that would guarantee that their prayer would be answered. And Jesus condemned that. Um, vain uh, repetitions is like going, you know, someone telling you, go home and say this prayer 10 times. You know, that, that's vain repetition. But persistence in prayer is different than that. Uh, persistence in prayer comes from a heart that is perhaps deeply burdened by something, and, and you almost can't not pray about that. Uh, there's a sense of urgency that almost just forces you to continually cry out to God. For example, let's say one of your family members is in the hospital and you're not sure if they're gonna make it. Well, you would be praying very persistently. You don't just pray, Lord, heal them and walk away and you know, no, you, you, boy, you have a great desire and urgency for you know, for the Lord to do something. And so you'd be, you would be praying persistently. And so there is a difference between just vain repetition and persistence in prayer where your heart is in it. And um, that's on, enough on that. And so we see Jesus taught us to, uh, he taught us to pray persistently. He demonstrated it. He commanded it. You know, honestly, I mean, that should be enough. We really don't need any more reason to do so. But there still remains, at least in my mind, a question, and that is why? 
Why did he command us to do this? Why must we still pray? Okay, it's a biblical idea where to do that, but why? And one of the things we'll see is that Jesus never directly answers that why question. But he does give us, a, there are a number of clues why, why we should. And so let's, um, uh, let me just look at a few of those. First of all, let me say uh, why we should pray persistently. It's not because we have to try to convince God of the need. It's not like we have to try to wear out his patience, you know, like that unjust judge and all right, I'll, you know, answer your prayer. It's not like that at all. It's not like that. That's not the reason. It's not like, you know, being like little kids do that just keep, you know, asking you for some special treat or whatever until you just, all right, all right, you give in. And it's not like that with God. Because uh, remember in that parable in Luke 18, Jesus was setting up a contrast between that unjust judge and God. Uh, so it's not that, I mean, God's, uh, he's already very interested in your welfare. He's not indifferent like this judge. He's, he's very interested in what happens to you. You don't have to convince them to try to get interested or involved. Uh, he is. Uh, so uh, let me give you a f uh, five things here. Um, some possible solutions as to why persistence in prayer is often called for. First one uh, is this. Since God is perfect, he doesn't need to change. He doesn't need to grow. But we do. Um, the Lord doesn't need to change his mind or his ways or his character. Maybe your husband says much the same thing or somebody. But anyway, uh, some, some of you Bible scholars might already be saying, well, uh, but it does say God changes his mind. And it does. There's a couple of places in the Old Testament that says God changed his mind. But he really didn't change his mind. All he did in those cases is he set up a condition. He said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. Usually it was a form of judgment. He said, this, you know, I've been so patient with you and I've given you umpteen chances to change. You refuse. And, and uh, so time's up. This is what I'm going to do unless you change your ways. And then they go, okay, we will change our ways. And God says, okay, I won't do that then. Now I'm going to do this. He really didn't change his mind. Uh, and uh, he knew uh, what I was gonna, the outcome would be anyway, but you, you're just setting up a condition. Anyway, that's another point. But God doesn't need to change his mind. His, uh, he doesn't need to grow. Uh, you know, however, we humans, though, we're always changing, should be always growing the rest of our lives. Uh, you know, it's supposed to be anyway. And I suppose some people get stuck at a certain point and they don't go beyond that, and that's sad. But we're to keep, uh, we keep growing keep learning new things. Uh, so what I want to say, the one point of prayer, one aspect of prayer is not to make God uh, to be like us, but it's to help make us more like God. It's not to make him so that he will want what we want. You know, yay, that's good. No, it's to make us be more like God to want the things he wants, which is a good thing. You know, so uh, uh, one aspect, vital aspect of prayer is that God uses prayer to make us more like him. Uh, we don't pray just to uh, let God know what we want. He already knows what we want. We still have to ask. Remember James 4 says, you do not have. Why? Because you didn't ask. Uh, we still need to ask, even though God already knows what you want. But as we spend time in prayer, prayer is, uh, as one guy put it, intimate fellowship with our Father. Talking with Him, God can use that time together to make us more like Him which is always a good thing. Prayer can do that. Prayer, so prayer changes us. Um, you could say there's kind of a couple attitude towards prayer. Some people have kind of a defensive attitude towards prayer. By that I mean uh, they only, uh, they pray, uh, you know, foxhole prayers. You know, when they're, uh, they're in a big, big mess and they, you know, they say, you know, God help me, I'm, you know, I'm in this big mess, get me out of it. Uh, nothing wrong with praying in times like that, that's for sure. But the sad thing is that sometimes, for some people, that's the only time they pray. Is when their backs are up against the wall, they've tried everything else, or they've ran out of options, and they go, okay, God, now I guess it's up to you. That's kind of a defensive attitude. Um, another attitude some have for prayer, though, is more of an aggressive attitude, and that is where they pray not only when they're in a trouble, and that's fine, 
but they also pray because they want to be more like Christ. They want to experience uh, more of his power in their lives. They want to demonstrate, more, be more of his character uh, in their lives. They want that, so they're praying for that. Uh, it teaches, that's where again, prayer can do things like teaches us patience, uh, teaches us hope, uh, teaches us persistence. These are good qualities. Uh, to have a good life, to be a success in life, you need those qualities. Prayer can teach those things. Uh, and sometimes, you know, that's why sometimes God will delay an answer to teach us what? The thing we don't like to learn, you know, patience. There's, God has good reasons for that. And that's one reason. Prayer, again, prayer changes us. God uses prayer to change us and delays are a part of that. Uh, another reason why uh, persistence in prayer is often called for is that, uh, and similar to the first one, is that because he does love us, uh, he sees that we're not ready for the answer yet. This is uh, real similar to like saying uh, the same reason why a good dad, maybe a bad dad would, but a good dad would not give, let's say, his four-year-old son a 30 odd six hunting rifle, you know? He's too young. He's not ready for that. Uh, of course, in this, maybe I should use a different phrase in this day where everyone's talking about guns so much. Uh, maybe I should use something else. Uh, you know, maybe a crossbow. Some people use that for deer hunting. Uh, anyway, you, you, want, you get the idea. The little kid can't handle that. He's not ready for it. And that's also another reason why sometimes God delays our answers is because he sees, we think we're ready, but he knows we're not ready for it. Just like for that kid, no matter how much that kid begs for that, he's not gonna get it. He's not ready for it, not the right time. All right, so that, that's another reason that the person himself is not ready for that. Another reason for answers to prayer is that the uh, circumstances in life are not quite ready for the answer. Uh, this, is, um, this is like, for example, let's say, uh, uh, you know, God knows just the right time when he's going to send his son Jesus back. Um, we don't know when that right time is. God knows. And so we may be praying, uh, you know, because even now he's getting all the circumstances ready for that. He's getting the peoples ready. He's getting the nations ready. Things are prophetically, things are falling into place. God knows the perfect time. And we might pray, you know, Lord, come back now. You know, Maranatha, come quickly, come come back now. And God says, no, it's not quite ready yet. It's all unfolding, but the time is not quite right. It's just the same thing like picking an apple before it's ripe, you know. A kid may say, I want an apple. Well, they're not ripe yet, you know. I want one now. Well, they're it's really green. You're not going to like it, but I want it. Well, you know, if you want an apple, you got to wait. They're not ripe yet. The time's not right yet. And that can be another reason why sometimes God delays answers to prayers because the time isn't right yet. But we don't know often for some of these things when the time is right, so we keep praying. Lord, is it now? Is it now? Is it time now? And the good thing about doing that, why we can do that, is that if we don't do it, we can become very complacent and we become indifferent or even lazy. Uh, but when we keep praying, even though we don't know, maybe the time's not right yet, we're not sure, uh, but it keeps our eyes focused on, on the Lord, and that's a good thing. So that's another reason why uh, there may be delays. Another reason for delays in prayers can be because we're harboring some sin in our lives, and that's blocking the answer to our prayers. Um, you know, we can't confess sin that we're not aware of, but if, if you are aware of something in your life that's not right, that you know is clearly not right, um, like James said, whatever is not from faith is sin. And if there's something, if the Lord's, you know, putting his finger on you, you know, you, well, you've been lying a lot lately or something or whatever, um, and you refuse to deal with that, and the Lord said, you know, that's not good. You're really hurting that person. When you do that, you need to stop that. And you go, I don't want to stop. I like doing that. I don't want to stop yet. And God says, all right, I have ways of dealing with that, with that kind of attitude. Psalm 66, 18, it says, <clears throat> it says, if I regard iniquity or sin in my heart, what? The Lord will not hear. What he's saying there, he's saying, if, if there's something that you know, you know, something you're aware of, 
and the Lord has made you aware of that and you go, I'm not, I like that. I'm not stopping that. I want to do that. Yeah, I may be wrong, but I like it. And God says, okay. Um, and you wonder why your prayers aren't being answered? He says, because he said, if you regard sin in your heart like that, I'm not going to hear your prayers. Wait, that's not fair. Well, no, you're, you're hurting yourself. You're hurting others by hanging on to this thing. And so we need to come clean. And then what joy that comes from there, relief comes from that, and many other things. So, but that can be another reason why uh, some prayers uh, aren't being answered or being delayed. Is, is that one more? I'll give one more. Another, and there could be other reasons too. I'm just giving five today. Uh, another reason for delays is that uh, having to wait for something uh, can sometimes greatly increase our appreciation for it. And it has a way of uh, purifying our desires. Again, it's, it's a way of changing us, growing us, maturing us, purifying what we're asking for. What I mean is, is this. Uh, let's say uh, when you're a kid, or let's say if you're a parent and your kid comes to you, and let's say it's August, and they say, here's what I want for Christmas, and they say something. Okay. And then they never mention it again. But come September and October, and you ask them, what do you want for Christmas? And they say, well, this is what I want, and then it's something else. And, they, and then they, and they keep mentioning one thing in particular. It's like, okay, if I don't get anything else, make sure you get me this. Well, as a parent, what are you going to do? Are you going to give them that one thing they mentioned way back in August, but never mention it again? Or are you going to give them that thing that they've been asking for day after day? Whatever you do, get me this. You would try to get them that, you know, as long as you can afford it and it's appropriate and whatever. Uh, and in kind of in the same way, by persistence in prayer, helps us to, it kind of purifies our desires. Uh, like, um, sometimes we pray for something and we never mention it again. You know, like someone might come say, man, I really wish I could get that job at Hans Bakery because I really like to eat donuts, you know. And then, uh, and I say, you never say that again. And somebody's going to say, well, wonder, does, did he really mean that? Does he, does he really want that? And so that's where, again, uh, a delay can help us with uh, weed out what are real needs and what are just passing whims. All of us have lots of just passing whims. And a delay can help weed those types of things out. Um, so uh, that's another reason. And, and there's more to it. Also, we could go on with that. But uh, So be persistent. That's what he's teaching. Be persistent in our prayers. You know, actually, this is very encouraging for us because the, uh, the widow was persistent and it's her persistence that got the judge finally to answer her, give her her request. And that her persistence was displeasing to the judge. But God is pleased with our persistence. It's not because we're trying to wear him out. He's pleased with that. He likes to see that. It's obvious as he mentions it and as Jesus demonstrated it and taught it. Because it can make us into the kind of person that he wants us to be. It, can, uh, 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 it's, it might make us into the kind of person who can actually handle that particular prayer answer. Whereas maybe if we'd gotten that answer to, to that prayer sooner, it might have just made us proud. Whereas now we would be very grateful. So there can be, you know, lots of reasons like that. So don't let any uh, delay shock your faith. Uh, as one guy said, our privilege is that we may pray. Our duty is that we ought to pray, and our constant work is that we ought always to pray. You know, all the great, you study, uh, and it's so fascinating, I encourage you to do it, all the Christian biographies, you know, of men and women and the things they face, they face similar things we face, and then how they handled it. And But all the great men and women of faith throughout, you know, uh, the Christian history, um, well, and throughout, you know, the biblical times, um, you know, whether it be guys like, you know, Martin Luther or uh, Apostle Paul, you know, Charles Spurgeon, and uh, all were men and women mighty in faith. I can't, I've never found a single exception to that. Never found an exception to that. All the men and women of who were mighty, mightily used of God were men and women mighty in faith. So, I mean, in, in prayer. Like John Knox, who was a great reformer, and he, was, uh, he prayed once, you know, God, give me Scotland or I'll die. And you see his, his 
you know, his passion. And uh, Queen Mary, who was uh, trying to kill him because she was trying to bring the British Isles back to Catholicism. John Knox was trying to bring in the Reformation. And uh, she was trying to kill him, but she made this remark, you know, I've, I'm more afraid of the prayers of John Knox than I am of all the armies of Europe. Uh, his prayers were that way. And ours, he was just a guy like us. And so we too can have that kind of prayer life. So keep on praying. Uh, when delay comes, what are we to do? Quit? Lose heart? No, we keep praying. We keep on. Keep on with a clean heart, uh, with a humble heart, with uh, praying in faith, uh, praying, uh, making sure we check our motives perhaps, uh, and rejoicing in the answer that's going to come. I like what Isaiah 62, 7 says this. It says, give the Lord no rest until he answers. That's the idea. I like that. So pray. Keep on praying. Remember what Jesus said? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. All right. Well, let's, let's pray.